You're going okay. back up. Okay, good deal. I just wiggle the battery a little bit. <laughs> so, as I was reading through, let me just start right into it. Um, as I was reading through Judges lately, there's this one story I came across, and there are a lot of stories. I mean, if you read through the Old Testament, there's so many details and so many stories, and I feel like the Bible is just so exhaustive that we never think, I think I know everything about the Bible now. <laughs> I think I can set it down for a couple of years. It's never like that. You read something that I, I don't really remember these details because it's just, I think, too big to comprehend for us. So God always wants us to stay in it and stay nourished of it, right? And so there's this one story. I got too far. Everybody's reading already. So there's this one story in Judges that I actually wanted to read, but it would take a little bit too long. So I'm just going to summarize it for you. And this is how it started. So now in those days, Israel had no king. That was before the first king Saul, before David and all that. There was a man from the tribe of Levi living in a remote area of the hill country of Ephraim. One day he brought home a woman from Bethlehem in Judah to be his concubine. And it's a raise, <laughs> rolling his eyes a little bit. And he's like, that's not a nice story. <laughs> I just read it. You just read it. Yeah. And it's, I was like, Lord, should I really bring up this story <laughs> at church? <laughs> but it's in the Bible. It's, it's his word that there's something in it that, you know, sometimes we, we get caught up in our own lives and we just want it nice and sheltered and we don't want to look at the ugly stuff. We don't want to turn on the media to see what's going on in Gaza and all these things or Ukraine. But sometimes it's the reality. It's happening. So I want to just, I, want, I don't want to read all the details right now, but I want to summarize it for you. So basically, that's how it starts. That's how the story starts. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. And it mentions that a couple of chapters before, several times. And it says, everybody did what was good in their own eyes. And so he had, a, he had a concubine. But then the concubine ran away back to his father, back to her father in Bethlehem. And so after about four months, he was going after her and he wanted her back. So he goes to Bethlehem and talks to the father, talks to her. And she agrees. The father agrees. So he's just respectful to the father. The father's very nice and says, just stay a few more days. I'm summarizing it. Day after day, he says, okay, now I'm gonna leave. He says, just stay a little bit longer. So at the end of the uh, six days, he finally leaves and goes back to Ephraim with his concubine, his servants, his donkeys, all the, um, the whole shebang. So he goes back and the first night they, they the day is going dark and they have to stop somewhere overnight. And his servant says, let's just stop right here. But he says, no, we're not going to stop in a foreign land. We want to stop where our countrymen are, where the Jewish people are. That's where, presuming that's where we're safe. So they stop in a, in a town called Gibeah. That's in the land of Benjamin. That's in the tribe of Benjamin. So they stop in that town, but nobody would let them in. Nobody would open that house for them. Sounds familiar? <laughs> they couldn't find a place to stay, just like Jesus did. So finally, this man, this older man, also from Ephraim, living in Gibeah, takes them in and says, do not stay in the Times Square. Wherever you stay, do not stay out there. So he takes them in, and after a little while, they had their own feet, they had their own donkeys. They didn't, they weren't a burden to anybody. They just wanted to stay at somebody's house, that's it, and go on the next day. So after a little bit, they feast and everything, and somebody knocks on the door. It turns out they're the leading man of the town, and they say, bring out this guy. We want to have sex with him. We want to kill him, actually. That was their intent. But first, we want to have fun and do all the vile things with him. Sounds familiar? Like Sodom and Gomorrah, when the angels, when Lot took the angels in. It's the same story all over again. And that's Israel. That's not, not Sodom and Gomorrah. The law was already given. That's, that's after everything was established out of Egypt. They were there in the land of Benjamin. Knock on the door and says, bring him out. And the, just like Lot responded, as it was appropriate, if somebody take, you know, comes in somebody's home, be responsible for them. And he says, take those people. Long story short, they, they take the concubine, the very concubine that he wanted to marry, Shuena Ray. He came after her after four months and took all this effort to come back. They 
they grab her and they rape her all night. She comes back in the morning, but when the sun comes up, he comes out and says, come on, we, we have to keep going. Get up, we have to keep going, but she wasn't responding. And so the Bible says, he took her, he took a knife and cut her into 12 pieces and sent it out to the tribes of Israel. And as you, just like whatever you is on your mind right now, that was on the mind of the people in Israel. They said, how can this happen? What is this? They didn't even know what was going on. So they said, something must be done about this horrible thing here. We don't even know the story about it, but something has to be done about this. So they gather all the soldiers from all the lands of Israel, from all the 11 tribes, 400,000 soldiers, and they walk down, they hear about that it happened in Benjamin. So they come down and, and ask the guy in Ephraim, he said, what happened? So he told them the story, he said, I went back to get my concubine. I was just going to Ephraim, I stopped in Benjamin because I thought it was safe in the town of Gibeah. And this is what happened. The leading man came and did this horrible thing. And all the people of Israel were united as one, it says, and they went down and they said, we asked the people in Benjamin and they should take these people out, they should bring us these people that are responsible for this and justice will be served, we'll execute them. And so they get down to Benjamin, they tell them that, and the Benjaminites, their response is, no, we're not handing them over. Actually, if you have a problem, you can fight us. And so they probably couldn't believe what was happening. They were praying and saying, Lord, what should we do? And the Lord says, Judah should attack first. So they were attacking their own tribe of Benjamin. They were attacking these people, and the Benjaminites were very strong soldiers, very well trained. And so they actually besiege Judah, and they killed 22,000 soldiers of Judah that day. So the people retreat, and they were crying out of Bethel, praying to the Lord, crying all day and saying, what should we do? This is horrible. So another tribe goes. Benjamin again wins and they, they, they kill 18,000 people. So the third day they're crying again, repenting to the Lord saying, what should we do? This is, this is just awful. And the Lord says, go back. This time I'll give them into your hands. The Lord says, fight the Benjaminites. So they go down, long story short, they win. Well, they win the battle. They kill all the Benjaminites except a couple hundred that flee into the mountains. They go back and kill every living thing. And you would think, oh yeah, that's a victory of, of this war that they just won. But actually the Israelites go back to Bethel and cry all day because it was horrible. And that's what they're saying at the end of this story in Judges 21. It says, the people went to Bethel where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. Lord God of Israel, they cried, why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing of Israel today? And he said, such a horrible thing has never happened since they brought, God brought them out of Egypt to the concubine, what happened. But this goes far beyond thousands, thousands of times more horrible the outcome of this whole situation and they, they couldn't, they were just in all these, why could this happen? I know the answer of why this happened. Jim was already saying the first words that <laughs> came up here when he said that. It says it back here, Israel had no king. That's how the story starts. And that's how the story ends. It says in the last verse, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did was what was right in their own eyes. And so is, how is that relevant for us today? I don't even want to say too much about this story. I want you to read it. I want you to go back and read it. The details of the story make it even more comprehensive and more relatable that I didn't go into right now, but the small, the small things, the details of what happened, the character of the guys involved, the characters and everything. So I want you to just keep this in mind. There are dozens of stories, almost as horrible as this one in the Old Testament, but then we get into a new era. Just wanna turn around <laughs> and go into the New Testament. And if you go into the New Testament, 
Jesus starts the whole thing. Actually, John the Baptist starts the whole thing. After all these stories of the Old Testament that are sometimes confusing in itself. Like the Jews look back at the history and it's, you know, really, they see it with, as if a veil is before their eyes. That's what it says. Only in the Gospels revealed. So what does all this mean? Why did all this happen? And then Jesus comes. But before Jesus comes, there is a, a prophet named John the Baptist, which Jesus says is the greatest prophet that has ever been born from a woman. The greatest prophet that has ever lived was John the Baptist. And all he did in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John the Baptist said. He preached the baptism of repentance. Jesus said the same thing. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first words of John the Baptist, the first words of Jesus, we go to Acts after Pentecost. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. It was the first thing that they said. In Acts 26, it says, Therefore King Agrippa, Paul is talking. He says, I, Paul, was not disobedient to the heavenly vision that he had when he converted, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all regions of Judea, and then the Gentiles, to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance, worthy of repentance. Anybody else? <laughs> In Mark 6, when Jesus sends out his disciples, they went out preaching that people should repent. It seems like, you know, whenever the Bible repeats something, you think, I should pay attention. What is going on there? <laughs> That's something important. So I want to just dive down deeper into this word repentance and just keep the story in the beginning, from the beginning in mind right now. When we think of repentance, the first thing that comes into the mind is, Stop sinning, right? That's, that's kind of the first thing. So if we go a little deeper, somebody would maybe say, I had another scripture here actually, I think. Just to see the weight of it, right? He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. So again, just reiterating what I already said. In the Old Testament, there's a lot of confusing stories, living by the law, living by doing the right thing. And then Jesus comes and says, repent. And that's important because that is leading up to this point. So he doesn't just forget the Old Testament, but this is how he starts, repent. So a little deeper, repentance means, it's a little blurry, is turning from sin and turning to God. Okay? But I think this is still more the outward appearance of what repentance does on the inside. It's kind of like, oh, you see a good basketball player on TV and you just try the same thing, but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know that he has been practicing for 20 years and doing all, he had the best trainers in the world, went to this specific college and did this work that's behind it that it's, I'm just saying, the things that we can't see we just see the outcome and think, oh yeah, I can just repent. But sometimes it's not that easy. So I want to just dive a little deeper in what this means. Since it seems like it's an important word in the Bible, if all Jesus, John the Baptist, Jesus, Paul, Peter, and all the other apostles was the first word that came out of their mouth, I think it's quite important. So when you look it up in the Greek, repent means metanoeo, can't spell this. <laughs> and it means to think differently. So right now, everything is a different meaning right now. You think, again, Old Testament, Jesus comes and he says, repent. What he really was saying, I don't know what he really said in Aramaic, but the Bible says it in Greek. There's also a reason because it was opened up to the whole world, to the Greek, to the Gentile, not just to the Hebrews and to the Jews alone, but now he's preaching and we have it in Greek. That's relevant because he says, think differently. Jesus comes and says, you guys need to change your mind. 
you expected one thing, but you need to think a little differently. This has multiple meanings. Let's just repent. You need to turn. You need to change the way you think. The change of one's mind. These are different uh, dictionaries that I looked it up. Or to undergo change in frame of mind and feeling even. So it's even deeper than that. Now, I was Googling the word repentance, and it actually says, in Wikipedia, the word actually repent means metanoia. The word repentance means metanoia. It has been used in psychology since the 19th century to describe a process of fundamental change in the human personality. Well, that's even deeper than that. That's not just, oh yeah, I'm gonna stop sitting. Well, that's what's happening on the outside. What's happening on the inside? It's a change of mind, it's a change of feeling, it's a change of personality. But that change, and as you always know, the harder you try, the harder it gets, the bigger you fail. <laughs> so it's not, we're not on the bottom of the barrel yet. We're gonna dive a little deeper. How can this happen? And before I go there, Romans 12, 2, that's what it reminds me of. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when Paul talks about that, that's actually what he means. He just says, repent. But you know what? Let's put it in a different way. Let's say you've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And after that process takes place, after you repent, which he describes here, you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it changes your character, it changes your perspective, it changes the things you think about, and all of a sudden you're going away from the things that you care about and actually can see the things God cares about and you can see His will clearly. So it's a deep thing that is going on. But it, I can already spoil, give you a spoiler alert. <laughs> it's not because of us that this happens. How does it happen? And the Bible answers this too. It says... In Romans 2, 4, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? It's not something that I say, oh, I, I, I say, and I shouldn't have done that. Sorry, and I won't do it again. Have you tried that before? How long does it last? <laughs> so, this is an important thing. It comes from God because of his kindness. And his goodness. I don't want to. I don't want to stay there. I want to go <laughs> to the bottom of this. So really, it is the good news, right, that leads us to repentance. There is this preacher online on YouTube. You've probably seen him. His name is Ray Comfort. Yeah, Living Waters. He preaches. He's been preaching for decades on the streets, and he's like they call him modern day Paul. So he just goes on the streets and he preaches the good news. And I watched an interview where he explains 40 years ago when he started doing that, he was saying, he was trying to preach the good news to people, but they weren't responding. Because it's, it's like he described, it's like you have, you're a doctor and you have a cure for cancer and you go to a person randomly on the street and you say, do you want to get this cure for cancer? And they say, what do you want? I don't need that, I'm healthy. So, if there is no bad news, then what are we doing with the good news? It's not good news at all, it's just news, right? And this is the universe that God created, this is the polarity that God created. Without evil, there is no good. Without us realizing that there is hatred and free choice and free will, there is no love, there is no real love. God is not a, a dictator, but He says, and I'm going to create you so all you can, you all can worship me and love me and love each other. And we say, yes, 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 and amen. That's not what he wants. It's free choice. So there must be both sides that we can choose from. But in order to receive the gospel, which means the good news, we have to have the bad news first. It comes with it. Otherwise, we don't understand it. It will never lead to repentance if we don't understand the bad news first. And so, if you go through it again, just a few examples. We see in this in, in the Old Testament, right? 40 years in the wilderness, why did they have to go through this? This was bad news. God didn't intend it, but as you know, when they were spying out the land, it was right in the beginning, after half a year or a year in the wilderness, they were spying out the land, and the 10 or 12 people came back, 
bad report. But Caleb and Joshua said, no, God promises that. We can do that. And they said, no, we can't do this. And it's not just that they, oh yeah, we want to rebel against God and you're wrong. It says the Israelites were weeping. They were crying and saying, we're lost, we're lost. They genuinely felt sorry for themselves. But it didn't help it. God said, I'm going to wipe them out. <laughs> Moses <laughs> went to the Lord and said, no, don't wipe them out. You make a bad reputation for yourself. This is not good, leading them out and then wiping them out. Just have patience. But he says, but this generation will not enter. They can live, but this generation will not. That was the reason why they, it was correction. Without the bad news, they weren't able to receive the good news yet of the promised land. They looked over, and this was not good news for them. They looked over, and the spies came back and reported, and they said, I thought this was the promised land. This is awful. I don't need that. And that's exactly when we go out there and we preach the gospel. They say, oh, yeah, I have to follow all these rules, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. That's not good news for me. Well, God hands us over to Satan and he says, okay, you live your life until you've learned your lesson and realize what the bad news are. Maybe the good news are much better than Babylon in exile, the same thing. Why did they have to go there? The same reason. Judges. If you read the, the book of Judges, <laughs> in two pages, it's like, Oh yeah, the Israelites did what was pleasing in the, in, the, in the eyes of the Lord, and they were blessed, and they lived blessed for 40 years, but then they had idol worship, brought it in, and the, somebody conquered them again. And I think in my Bible, it goes back and forth about 10 times in two pages, and you're just like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> this is crazy. This is, not even, this is before the kings even, but it's just a back and forth story, the whole Old Testament pretty much. And then it leads up to the Levites concubine that we just heard. Such a horrible story. How can this happen? But that's what I'm digging into. How can it get that far? How can we drift off this far? And you might say, well, this is an Old Testament uh, system. This is an Old Testament mindset. And this is just leading up to salvation. Once we have we've repented and have salvation, then we don't need this anymore, right? We've repented already one time, and that's it. But that's really not what we see in the New Testament. You go to 1 Corinthians and Paul's saying, there's a man in your congregation, he's a Christian, but there's sexual immorality. And he says something that is even considered vile in the eyes of the Gentiles. And you should excommunicate him. Hand him over to the, to the hand of Satan. That's what he's saying. And in 2 Corinthians, he comes back and says, I'm so sorry that I, that I hurt you. I, I didn't want this to happen. But godly repentance actually is what I wanted from you. I didn't want to cause you sorrow, but real godly sorrow leads to repentance, is what he says. And so, basically saying, when this man has understood what had happened, what he had done, he can turn around and come back into community. He says, get him out, until he learned his lesson. The same thing with Hymenaeus and Alexander, First Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, I've handed them over to Satan. These were teachers of the, of the gospel, but now they have become greedy, they, they would just want to go after the money, and I handed them over to Satan, so that their soul might be saved. But, you just, I see what I'm saying, why do bad things happen to us? Why do the bad news happen to us? It's because this is the only way we would ever learn that fundamental change from the inside. So the church in Ephesus, the same thing, God rebukes them and says, um, that I will take the, if you do not repent, I will take the lampstand from you. He's saying the same thing to other churches too. And it's the same thing now. And a couple years ago, Jane and I were speaking at a lot of different churches. It was just a year where we moved over here and God made it clear that we were supposed to settle down here. We didn't have any work, but all of a sudden God opened these doors for all these churches to speak at. So what we did was we spoke at almost 30, about 30 different churches and then Christian schools and rehab places and all different kinds of Christian organizations in just one year in 2022. And what we did, what our calling still is, but back then, every day, every Monday after speaking, we thought, what is our job this week? 
And we thought, okay, we just need to be in the Bible. We need to read the Word of God. We need to pray. We need to work on these things, meditate, and not just prepare a message. We were mainly sharing our testimonies. So we were just preparing our spirit for the next service on Sunday. Whatever we read about, we might not have necessarily preached about, but we were just preparing our spirit. And this was a, a year that we drew really close to the Lord. This is what we did every week. We preached on Sundays, and then Monday we just, not to prepare a message, but just to be changed. We were yeah. just reading and praying and just soaking it in. And in this year, in speaking all these different churches, God revealed to me this understanding of, I realized most people, most people in the churches, that's what God revealed to me, are so occupied with their circumstances and so buried in the circumstances that they can barely breathe, they can barely keep the head above the water. That's why most most churches preach about, oh, God loves you, God has this done this for you, and this is what, see that your work is better, that your relationships are better, that this is better, but it never comes into the calling. People never come into the calling because they barely survive. In this year when I was reading the Bible, doing all these things, we didn't have a baby, we didn't have, you know, we're all the time in the world. I don't even know what we did with all this time. <laughs> so in the last few months, God taught me a lesson. Amen. And especially the last couple months. Before me, you know, you on your mind, you're like, you need to stretch, you need to work out, you need to warm up with the turmoil, there's the costumes, there's this, there's that. And, and then, oh yeah, we need to take care of the baby. And usually... You stretch before you go in the air and do your acrobatic, you know, we need to be responsible for what we're doing and professional in what we're doing so that we're safe. And sometimes, okay, at night we come home, we do prepare baby bottles, we, we cook dinner, and we go to sleep because we need our sleep. We can't just sleep on five hours and then go 30 feet in the air the next day. We can't do that. So we really, we were just here. And guess what happened? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> bad news, you know, bad news. I was just exhausted. We were not reading the Bible as we should. We were not praying as we should. And I felt really, oh yeah, God revealed this to me a couple of years ago. You know? <laughs> yeah, like Paul said, I, I make sure that I myself are being clean before I preach the gospel, before I do this. And yesterday, I was just... <clears throat> I was just venting to Ray. We were sitting down there, and after 45 minutes of me just, you know, putting all this stuff on him, he really hit the nail on the head of all the sermon that was already written. He said, so what did you learn from this? And that's, that's really what God wants from us. That's why this, he allows these things. That's why he has patience with us. That's why he has grace. It's the same thing now. Can you try on the computer to go over one slide? <clears throat> Maybe you have to um, exit and, and just manually open the next slide. But when you're in that place, when you're in that place of just being here and buried and thinking, how do I make time of God? You almost have like a, it feels like a brain fog. That's how it felt to me in that, in that you're just so occupied with all these things. It's hard to think clear. It's hard to make a decision. It's, it, you're just, you know, basically, I have it on my phone. <clears throat> I'm going to pull it up. You can see the picture later. And it says in Ephesians 4, 17 to 18, it says in the Amplified Bible, You must no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their minds, for their understanding is darkened, and their reasoning is clouded. That's what he tells them. Don't live like that. Don't live in that self-centered, self-consumed world where you're just in the clouds and just thinking about yourself and thinking about nothing important, and you, you can't think clear. He calls them out of this, out of this state. Okay, so in Luke chapter 22, verse 40, when he came to the place, 
he said to them, Pray that you may not enter or fall into temptation. This is an important thing. If we stop praying, we fall asleep like the disciples did yeah. on the most important night of their lives. <laughs> the last time they had with Jesus, the king, when he just told him he went away, he was going away, and where I'm going, you cannot come right now. And they fall asleep in the most important night. Yeah. He says, you need to pray, otherwise you fall asleep. But there is this one scripture, thank you. Oh, okay. Let me see. I, I think I can control it now again. Maybe not. <laughs> Let's get to the one um, where it says 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I'm going to read it to you. It says, so again, when you're in that place, in that cloudiness, yeah. and of that place where there's just brain fog, you need to understand. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except that is common to mankind. Nothing new under the sun. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. I'm going to read that again. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. That's what he's saying. <coughs> but it feels like it, yeah. right? It feels like, well, I can't make time. I can't do this right now. I, I, we have all these excuses. We feel sorry for ourselves. But it says, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure. That's what he's saying. <laughs> I had some beautiful slides. <laughs> it's all right. <clears throat> can you go to that slide with the, with the sun in the background? I'm not going to get hung up on that, but I really want it. <laughs> this one? Sorry. Let's go to that. Okay. Okay. This is all of you. Good. Yep, that's it. Okay, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I really, it's all right. I want to sum it up for you. And I know we got distracted a little bit right now, but I want to, I want to just bring it back and and sum it up for you because it's not that simple. You know, when we're in that situation. And you know that everybody has gone through this dozens of times, maybe hundreds of times, if you're going to believe it long enough. And you see, oh, there's this sin in my life and I want to battle, battle it. Oh, I just stopped doing it. This is happening on the surface level and we can't do it. We can't do it. And so it's not just simply saying, oh, sorry, God, I won't do it again. Because it happens again and again and again. And you think, what is wrong with me? Like, why can't I not get rid of this? And so we have to dig a little deeper and we have to come out of this fog and stop feeling sorry for ourselves and realize this is not uncommon. I'm not this one in, in 10 million, one in 9 billion that this happens to and I can't escape. No, God provided a way out. And so if we acknowledge the bad news first, if we acknowledge that, okay, I'm broken, I live in this broken world and I, I can't do it by myself, and I'm under this curse that happened that Adam brought on mankind. I'm living here in this body, and this is what's happening. This isn't the condition that I'm in right now. Even if I've been, I've been saved and I take my eyes off of Jesus, this can happen to us, as we've seen in many other people that happened in the New Testament. And so, what happened to the people in Israel? They said, why has this happened? Because they didn't acknowledge, they didn't have a king. That was the period before the king, but now we have a king. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and his 
reign is for eternity. His reign, his kingdom will never end. Right. And we have a king. We can turn to a king. Amen. And we know what happens without one. So we look at him and we see how good he is. First, we have to see how broken we are and have to really acknowledge it deep down how broken we are so we can look at him and see how good he is because then the good news makes sense and it's really good news for us. Yeah. And we look at what he has done and this, like I heard over there, this grace. This is grace that he has given us something that we don't deserve at the moment. He has given us this and this leads to repentance. That attitude leads to repentance, not outwards, but the repentance that truly happens on the inside, that changes our character, that changes fundamentally how we think, our heart, our being, our personality, it changes everything. And so what we really see is this moment right here. Yes. That's us. Yeah. That's Jesus. <laughs> In case you didn't notice it. And we are pretty dirty here. And it says, he left the 99 to rescue me. So if you feel that guilt, that dirtiness, that this bad news on us, we turn around and we really see that he left the 99 to rescue us. It's not us that dig us out of this. How is this little sheep going to wash itself? It's not going to happen. But we have to turn around and trust him and confess our sins. And he cleanses us. <coughs> this is what he does. We turn to him and we just look at him and we stand still. He says, just stand still and remain in my presence. And this is what he does. He just washes us down and he blow dries us and he gives us a bubble bath. <laughs> Amen. You know, and what happens is really, this is where we end up. Oh, That's, That's repentance. Amen.